Come on, come on. Wasn't that a great story? That's amazing. All right, so that's um, our moment of hope for today, and we want to say a great big thank you um, to all of those of you who uh, generously give to Kingwood. Um, we're, we're becoming a movement of hope because of your, your giving and investment, and we want to invite everybody, take your phone out and scan the QR code on the chair in front of you. If you're online, scan the QR code on the screen, and what you're going to find is what you heard Emily talk about in that video, and that is uh, an invitation. We have made invite cards, okay? So if you're online, you can get these digitally. You can, of course, if you're in the room, you can get them digitally also. But if you're on campus, on your way out this morning, all of our invite cards have been uh, turned to Christmas invite cards. And so I want to, if you don't have any yet, I want to encourage you to get some because Shelby County is the most unchurched county in the state of Alabama where tens of thousands of people have no one praying for them, no one inviting them, and no one sharing their faith with them, and no one caring about them spiritually. That's the reality. And on December 17th, we're going to have a great big Christmas celebration and outreach, and I want to encourage you to invite someone to be part of that, okay? So um, pick up some cards on your way out. Scan the QR code, get some digital cards. Maybe you want to text one to a friend. One invitation can be the catalyst that changes someone's life, right? And so, um, man, I just think that God invites us to join him in that mission with Jesus. So I'm, I'm asking you to do that and be part of that with us. And to remind you that also being a part of a movement of hope as you scan the QR code and you can see our top three things at Kingwood, the second one on the list is Giving Tuesday, which is just a couple days away. We'll be uh, giving. Uh, our church will be receiving a big offering, and all that we get is going to go out. You can see the list of ministries and organizations in our community that we want to help this Christmas and, and help spread the message of hope. So uh, I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Who had a good Thanksgiving? Yeah? All the people that didn't aren't here. <laughs> they're, they're checked out. Well, um, I'm glad you did because now it's time for Christmas. You ready to go again? Uh, it's, it's, it's Christmas season is, I guess, officially starting. And I got a question for you. Are you ready? Yes. Mixed. Okay. So there's two kinds of people when it comes to Christmas, those who anticipate it with delight and those who anticipate it with dread. And so those of you who are in the delight camp, here's kind of what you do. Uh, you know, you've had your Christmas tree up since September, <laughs> right? Everybody knows who we're talking about. You, you, you've, you got, you've been blaring Christmas music with the windows down when it was 90 degrees, you know. And, and, uh, and this whole thing is going to be a big delight to you. You can't wait for it. It's one big giant party that lasts, you know, a month. Let's talk about the dread people. <laughs> You're thinking, where are the Tums? You know, this is one big, giant, long 30-day Melanta moment, right? Because there's so much to do, and there just always feels like there's not enough time to do it. But here's the thing. No matter which camp that you're in, we all have a similar um, temptation or risk. And that is we kind of miss the moment. So Christmas has become very commercialized. If you're over 40, you remember when we used to celebrate Christmas starting in December? Anybody remember that? Like, you wouldn't even bring your tree out until, you know, remember late in December? And, uh, man, I, I have dug my heels in, and I have fought that for years. Every year I complain, I can't believe it's Christmas stuff. So, you know, I'm, the, I'm that guy. I'm just going to tell you, I'm that guy. Because I, I, I feel bad for Thanksgiving. You know, I go, listen, it, it, it's, a, it's a celebration of gratitude. I mean, Come on, why are we skipping this? And I'm the guy that's dug my heels in and I fought it. And you know what? I just keep losing. Have you noticed that? Like nobody's listening. Walmart doesn't care. Amazon doesn't care. You know, Black Friday sale is 30 days long now. It's like a whole month. Nobody cares. It's become commercialized. So now literally on October 31st at midnight, all the Halloween junk goes away and the red and green comes out for November 1. I got a feeling they're not going to change. You think so? You know why? It's market-driven. Because we're finding more and more and more ways to make more and more money 
off the holidays, and that, um, that drive seeps into and affects all of our lives. And so the expectation on what you and I need to do to really have a good Christmas keeps getting higher and higher and higher every year. And so here's my concern for all of us. We face the danger that we miss the real message of Christmas. There's so much sparkle that we're tempted to miss the substance. And this year, I want to try to help us to connect with the, with the substance of Christmas. Uh, so I don't know if you like documentaries. Documentaries have been exploding here in the last few years, and I like documentaries. Uh, anybody like documentaries? You, you're online. Give us a little thumbs up. You like documentaries? Um, and I think whoever are the people are that make these, man, they're getting good. They're getting really, really good. And documentaries are awesome because... They oftentimes take stories that you already know, but you don't know all of it, and then they tell you more. Uh, they kind of reveal so you can kind of appreciate the full story. So, like, uh, I watched the documentary on the Boston bomber. Anybody seen that one? I mean, I, w I was alive when that happened. I remember when that happened. I remember when the Boston Marathon happened and somebody set a bomb, to, and I heard it on the news, and I was like, man, that's terrible. I mean, that's terrible, but that's it. I didn't know any more. And I zeroed in on the TV, you know, I watched, I don't know how many hours that was, well, how many ever hours of my life I won't get back now. I zeroed in and I watched that Boston Bomber uh, documentary and I thought, man, that guy, you know, and you see all the details and you appreciate all the stuff that went on behind the scenes and you really understand. That, that story impacted my life in a much more dramatic way because I had a fuller understanding of it. And then, then the Murdow murders. Anybody seen that, that crazy farm? That is, I mean, that is a whole other thing. Well, kind of like that, that's what this Christmas series is about. It's, um, it's about the untold stories of Christmas. Details that you might not have known. Do you think it's possible that you and I have become so familiar with the Christmas story we don't fully appreciate it? Is it possible that we become so familiar that we don't realize the power of what a world-changing event it actually is? So when I ask you, are you ready for Christmas, I'm not asking, is your house decorated? I'm not asking, how's your shopping going? I'm not asking, do you have the menu for Christmas lunch yet? Here's what I'm asking. Is your heart ready? You have a plan to buy Christmas presents. You probably have a budget. I hope you do. <laughs> For all of your sakes. You, you probably have a schedule. You probably have a day you're going to go to this person's house and a day you're going to go to this person's house. And you probably have a menu. So you, you probably have a pretty good idea, even if it's not written down anywhere, it's just in your head, you probably have a pretty good idea how this is all going to go down. Do you have any plan to prepare your heart for Christmas? Do you have any plan to look past the sparkle and get to the substance? Have you, have you, have you put any, any energy or any effort into that? So here's my invitation to you. My invitation is to take a journey with us over the next few weeks to receive some of the untold parts of Jesus' birth so that you and I can understand the power of what happened. And what I'm inviting you to do is to lean in and allow the birth of Jesus to actually touch your heart. So here's how we're going to do that in the next few weeks. We're going to look at five simple truths from Jesus' birth, and we're going to um, try to unearth some other parts of the story that you might not know so you understand how amazing this story actually is. So here's the first one. Number one, Jesus came in the flesh. So the story of Jesus doesn't start with once upon a time. The reason it doesn't start with, most of our stories start with once upon a time. Have you noticed that? Because they're make-believe and they're intended to make us feel good. But the story of Jesus is neither make-believe nor myth. So it doesn't start with once upon a time. It starts like this, John 1, 14. Christ became human flesh and lived among us. 
This isn't a, this isn't a fairy tale. Why, why did Jesus uh, become human? Well, because he wanted to walk a mile in our shoes. He wanted to experience what it was like to be human, so he took on our lungs and he took on our legs and he took on our uh, skeleton and he took on our skin and he took on our heart and he took on our heartaches because he wanted to know what it was like to live fully human. So think about it like this. The God who slung 100 billion stars in the sky and created things the James Webb telescope hasn't even found yet became a little helpless human baby and lived in an animal trough. Slept in an animal trough. That's the same God we're talking about. The God who spoke the world in existence became a baby that cried and a man who wept. It's flesh and blood. You can touch it. This is real. This is a real story. You may have been amazed as I am how oftentimes kids just kind of get this. Children kind of get it. They kind of get these plain, simple truths, and they just accept it at face value. But sometimes we adults tend to um, start to act or live like it's fictional. We struggle with it sometimes. Maybe, maybe you've heard the story of a little children's play where, you know, they got the little, little boy playing Joseph and the little girl playing Mary, and they got a little fake doll, and they're on their way to, you know, to, to uh, Jerusalem to be counted in the census and all that. And uh, they, go to the, they go to the inn. Remember, you, you, everybody knows the story. And the little innkeeper says, there's no room in the inn. So, you know, little seven- and eight-year-old Mary and Joseph turn away, you know, di- distraught. But the, but the little innkeeper then turns and says, but it's okay, you can stay at my house. You see, children get it. They just get the story. They get the truth. They get the reality. They kind of get what's underneath it. Why did Jesus become human in the first place? To show us how to fully be alive. He was a baby and then a toddler and then a teenager and then a young adult and then he became a carpenter's apprentice. Why? Because he wanted to take the whole human journey And by becoming a human, he dealt with the two greatest limitations that you and I have ever faced in our life. The two greatest limitations. Here they are in Hebrews 2.14. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Did you see the two greatest limitations that you and I face? The power of the devil and the power of death. And Jesus became a human being because it was the only way to defeat those two. So imagine the power of the devil defeated. The power of death defeated. That's what Jesus' birth meant. That's what Jesus' birth made possible so you and I could live fully alive. Here's my question for you today. Do you believe that Jesus is real? Now you say, well, we're in a church. I'm supposed to say yes. Do you live like Jesus is real? Let me be more specific. Will you celebrate Christmas like Jesus is real? Do you have a plan to celebrate Jesus? Do you have a way to prepare your heart so that you can encounter this real Jesus who was really born in a real human body and lived a real life? Have you... Have you encountered the wonder of what it means that Jesus came as a person? A real person, not make-believe. Now, here's the second one. Jesus came at just the right time. So, Jesus wasn't late. He wasn't early. He didn't, um, he didn't miss it by a day, right? Galatians 4.4 4 says, But when the set time had fully come... God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. What's the right time? The right time was the time that God decided. It's almost like you get this picture in heaven that God's sitting there watching this 
whole thing in human history play out. And there's this giant hourglass with sand dropping through it. And you can see the angels saying, now? No, not now. How about now? No, not now. Now? No, not now. When the last grain of sand drops through the hourglass, then the time will come. And at just the right time, Jesus came to earth. There are two Greek words in the New Testament that um, are used for the word time in English. One means uh, a season, like winter or summer or this time of year or this time of life. Another one means a specific moment in time, a specific event on a calendar. Here's what's amazing about Jesus' arrival on earth. He did both. <laughs> it was the right season, and it was the exact right moment. Those two Greek words come together in the arrival of Jesus on earth at exactly the right time and exactly the right day Jesus was born. Luke 2, 6 says it like this. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So this isn't just the end of Mary's pregnancy. This is the beginning of the most significant event in all of human history. Think about it. All the dominoes in the world had lined up. The political dominoes, the social, the... Uh, um, the cultural things that all lined up. So let me just give you a couple of examples on why it was the right time for Jesus to come to earth. So um, historically speaking, it wasn't that long before Jesus came to earth that writing was not a very common thing. Uh, kings wrote letters. Military leaders wrote letters. Uh, scribes wrote letters. But the common person didn't, didn't write. And so, uh, because the, the materials that we had to write on were so primitive. We had metal, animal skin, and clay. And none of those were very easy to write on. And so, you could kind of imagine, you know, a young guy away from home going to write his mom a letter, and he takes out some metal, metal you know, dear mom, <laughs> D, <laughs> Maybe that explains why, you know, mothers don't receive letters from their sons. I don't know. Maybe there's some history there. But letters weren't easy to write. And so they rarely ever happened. It was a privilege of the upper class for sure. But this changed before Jesus came to earth. The Egyptians uh, mass produced paper from the papyrus plant. The papyrus plant was. Uh, prolific along the bank of the Nile River. And what they learned how to do is they learned how to take that plant, they learned how to cut it in thin sheets, and then lay it out in the sun and let it dry, and then weave it in a certain way and kind of melt it together. And the, the process that they figured out made paper affordable and accessible to common people. Now, why does that matter? Here's why that matters. Because in the New Testament, there are 27 books. They're written by seven or eight or maybe nine people. They're written by a few people. None of them were kings, none of them were military leaders, and none of them were scribes. They were carpenters and tax collectors and fishermen. And, and, and by the way, this paper that the Egyptians invented was the, the uh, primary writing source for the longest amount of time in human history. Even modern paper has not lasted as long as that surface lasted. And so the, when you open your Bible, when you open your Bible app and you have words there about the person of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, had Jesus not come, had he come earlier, we'd have had nothing to write it down on. And the common people would have no way to write it down. And Jesus' disciples were by and large commoners. And so Jesus came at just the right time. And therefore we have a New Testament and we have a Bible and we have all of these other things. Do you think that's a coincidence? I don't think it's a coincidence. Here's another one. 
The Roman road system is an absolute engineering wonder. Two to three hundred years before Jesus came to earth, the Roman road system uh, began being built. At its peak, it had 250,000 miles of roadways that connected 113 different provinces. Now, why does that matter? Because about 30 years after Jesus died, the church went from 120 people in Jerusalem to thousands of people in 32 countries and 54 cities and nine islands. How do you think the message of Jesus spread that fast with no cell phone, with no internet, with no, no printer, with no copier, with no mass communication? How did the gospel spread in 30 years? The Roman road system. When the Bible says that when the time had fully come, Jesus came to earth. This is what it means. Was that a coincidence? Was that a coincidence that the Father was sitting in heaven saying, at just the right time? Are you grateful for God's timing in sending Jesus to the world? Here's the thing. Are you not only grateful for God's timing and when Jesus was born, are you grateful for God's timing in your life? Because here's the thing. The story of Jesus' birth and the timing of his birth gives you and I a huge amount of confidence that God's still never late and he's still never early. He's right on time. And that's still... That's still true. So how do you and I um, get past the sparkle into the substance? Well, Jesus' mother, uh, Mary, gives us a great insight on that. So you remember Jesus' mother uh, had an angel appear to her. She was a young teenage girl. And this angel says, you know, you're going you're to give birth to Jesus. How, you know, how can this be? I'm not even married. You know, it goes through the whole thing. Well, fast forward, she's, she's pregnant. They travel. They do the census. They do the whole story. She has the baby. Shepherds come, and shepherds see angels in the field, and, you know, they run over and uh, witness the baby Jesus. And then something, something um, quiet, something subtle, Something little happened that we can, like when we read the Christmas story, we can, it's so subtle we can kind of read past it. But Mary did something that I think is so valuable for you and I. And here's what she did in Luke 2 19. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary treasured up, so it, it all happened. It all happened just like the angel said it was going to happen. And then the Bible says that Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them. How do you prepare your heart for Christmas, not just your house? How do, how do you do that? Treasure up these things in your heart. In your own journey, find a space to read the Christmas story. Find a space to zero in on the birth of Christ and maybe just read that event over and over and over throughout the Christmas season and let it really soak deeply into your bones. Reflect on it. Ponder it. Treasure it up in your heart. What does it mean? What does it mean that God, God, the God, sent his son to become a human and walk in your shoes. What does it mean? What does it mean to you? What does it mean for you? What does it mean for now? So I, I, I brought three questions that I think can help us in our treasuring and our pondering and are searching. So you can ask yourself this question as you're leaning into the Christmas story. Here's the first one. 
do, do I really believe that Jesus is real? Do I really believe that Je- not fictional, not mythological, not he was a good guy, not he was a good man, not he was a good prophet, not he's a historical figure. Do I really believe that Jesus is, is real? The real son of God, the real member of the Trinity, the real, the bright and the morning star. Do I really believe that he's everything the Bible says he is? Here's the second one. Am I grateful for God's timing with Jesus' birth? Do I really understand the significance of what it meant that God sent Jesus at that time? Not earlier, not later. There were so many other historical reasons that we don't even have time to talk about today. Am I really grateful that God's timing was perfect with Jesus? Here's the last one. Do I trust God's timing in my own life? You know, you know I find uh, a lot of life is waiting. I, I read something years ago. Uh, on average, we spend six months of our lives at stoplights. Makes you want to not, not commute anymore, doesn't it? What a waste. Six months of our life at stoplights uh, waiting you know maybe today you're here and you're waiting on direction you're waiting to meet somebody and get married maybe you're waiting on an opportunity you might be waiting to retire you're waiting to have grandkids waiting for circumstances in your life to change. When are these circumstances going to ever change? Maybe you're waiting to have children. Maybe there's someone in your life, a spouse, a, a parent, a child, friend, relative, you've been praying that they would, that they would find Jesus. And you're just in this middle space where, you're, where you never can really get settled because there's this inner turmoil because you're just waiting. Maybe, maybe you're waiting to find the right career, waiting for healing and restoration to happen in your body, you're recovering. Maybe you're waiting for the tension in a relationship to get resolved. And boy, the holidays, we think about that more, don't we? It could be, you know, a month-long tension cycle it could be years but you got this unsettled feeling of waiting you could be waiting for one of your prayers to be answered I've been praying about this and praying about this but just waiting it could be like our family you're waiting on, on the heaviness of grief to lift could be waiting on clarity. You know, uh, waiting is, um, well, it's miserable, <laughs> isn't it? But, here's, but it's not unuseful. Waiting is always an invitation from God to come close. Waiting is always an invitation from God to hear, to really hear with your heart. Waiting is always an invitation from God to lean in and listen and to learn to trust him. Do you trust God and do you trust his timing in your life? And it's such an ironic thing. The longer that you wait on him, if you lean in, actually the more you learn to trust him. You would think it would be the other way. If he would just, if he just resolved this, that's when my trust would grow. No, it's when I don't know what's going to happen and I don't know the answer and I'm walking in the dark and there seems to be no way out and there seems to be no resolution and I'm literally over my head in this thing and I'm just wandering through the fog and the only thing I have left to hang on to is God. Can I tell you, 
that's when you learn to trust him. What are you waiting for? You, you waiting on something this year? There's two ways to wait. One way is we just endure it. We're miserable. The other way is what I call active waiting. You lean in. You say, now God, I'm waiting on you today and that doesn't mean that every day that I wake up, I expect that today is gonna be an answer or a solution or a resolution or whatever. I want that today. And I pray for that today, and I ask for that today. However, if it's not today, I'm still here. And I'm going to lean in, and I'm going to wait. That's what waiting on God looks like. So would you stand with me this morning, and maybe today um, you're, you're waiting on something. Maybe you're online with us today, and you, boy, that really resonated with you our prayer team is, is live and they've been praying for you today and they would love right now to join with you in prayer. So I wanna ask you if you'll go to the comment section and if you have a prayer need, just list it there and a, a one of our prayer team's gonna meet you there. Would you, would you just join me in prayer for a moment and, uh, and then we're gonna, we're gonna lift our heart and our voice in this song. But let's just quiet our hearts for a minute. Jesus, your mother gave us such a powerful example that we would treasure up and ponder these things in our heart. And so this year, this moment, we pause and we wait and we say, God, I, I lean I lean toward you in my waiting. I lean toward you in my need. I lean toward you in this moment. And Lord, I ask you to grow my trust and to grow my faith as I'm leaning on you. Lord, I thank you today that you are, you are encouraging the discouraged. You are lifting up the heavy-hearted. Those whose lives have been empty and filled with some kind of void. Lord, you're, you're beginning to fill in some of those pieces. God, I just thank you for Jesus. Father, I thank you that you sent him in the flesh. He walked in my shoes. He felt what I feel, and he came at the right time. And so, Lord, I believe if you can do that, you can do what you need to do with my life too. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name.